I was just seeing uh, it's probably about the right time for us to begin thinking about the Inferno, talking about it. Maybe you know, maybe you've already been reading a little bit of it, and, and it's a good chance for us to to just sort of uh, get a sense of where the whole thing's going. And so, I'm going to talk for maybe ten minutes. I'm going to try to do this about uh, once every week or so. Give like a ten minute breakdown of things. Currently, I'm reading the Paradiso because it's the most difficult for me, and so I want to encounter it first before I go back over everything else. But, um, but yeah, it would make sense for you to start by reading the Inferno and just start there. And a couple of things that you need to know entering into it, if you don't know, uh, we know that this is uh, kind of autobiographical in a way. We don't really call it an autobiography because there's there's a two there's a sort of split. In the character, we call it the poet and the pilgrim of Dante. So Dante is the poet, but he's also the pilgrim. Uh, he's also the main character, and uh, but the the action of the story is as a pilgrim, someone who's there to learn, to experience something, to witness to something. And so that's the case for the whole Divine Comedy. The heroism of Dante is not him achieving some act, but him achieving some knowledge. And so it's it's a different kind of epic than than the world really has ever seen before. Uh, most other epics are always detailing by analog uh, some great achievement in, in the in the act of, of the human person, and and through the long course of the medieval uh, tradition, where the intellectual life is the is the height of the human person, uh, Dante comes out and brings about this epic. He he tests whether the Christian mode can be an, an epic in the world, and absolutely it is. And uh, he's able to sum everything up within this work. And so <clears throat> the cosmos is real in this. Now, he's a pilgrim walking through it, but he's also the poet. We know that the two of them are the, of, is Dante uh, because by the end of the Purgatorio, we finally hear someone called Dante by his name. And so, but it takes, it takes, it's all the way to the end of the Purgatorio. Beatrice says Dante's name. And so it's actually in the print. So we know for sure that this person is Dante. But of course, with, with all the research that's been done over the centuries, so much research has been done on this. Uh, you would know that this is, this is about Dante's life to some extent, or at least it's an analog. His life is an analog of some of the, of the everyman, of the journey towards God. The other thing to keep in mind is that the events of the Divine Comedy take place uh, around the year 1300, and Dante is exiled from Florence in 1302, 1303, um, and so it all takes place before he's exiled. And so it's some coming to knowledge before he gets uh, persecuted by his own by his own country, by his own people, by the Florentines. So, so anyway, all those things we sort of work through those things together. But really, the, the major uh, action uh, is really coming to know uh, things. But but the one word, the one one word I want to focus on for today is just the word "disio." And it's all over the place in the Divine Comedy, and it's it's desire, and so in in many ways, this epic is 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 a sort of contemplation of the problem of desire, and uh, and as I'm reading the Paradiso, uh, Beatrice explains to Dante at some point that the greatest gift that God gave is is free will. What's the greatest gift? And uh, this is in reference to um, the souls who are in heaven um, who, who broke a vow, but they're still heavenly, but they broke a vow. So they're kind of, they're, they're in sort of a little bit more of the shady part of heaven, but they're still in heaven. So it doesn't really matter. But, but essentially the discussion of the vow um, and, and of the free will and, and what, you, what you come to understand, at least in this, at this point in the Paradiso at the beginning, is that the Divine Comedy is filled with these sort of upside-down ironies. And, and what you see at this point is that, that God gave, the greatest gift he gave was free will. What we begin to see is that uh, kind of, that 
the greatest gift God gave was for him to become an object of our desire. The one who's rightfully the subject of all things has allowed himself to become an object. And so we can think of God as an object of our desire. Um, but, but there's also something um, disordered about that. And so, so desire then becomes sort of the response between subject and object. That's, that's the major contemplation of this, of this whole epic, is our relationship to things. And then uh, it's easy enough to desire things that are beneath us. But what, what does it mean to desire something that's greater than us? And then to make that an object of your desire. Um, within the formulation of a subject and object, it's, it's seemingly okay like that, that God is an object of our desire because God is allowed for that. And yet there's something disordered about making God an object. But we can't make him a subject uh, because I, can't, I don't think as God. And so the movement towards the Paradiso is to begin to, to in a way, sort of reorder that, or fix, re-justify that, that order where, where we properly become an object the way, the way God can can love us as an object. You see it throughout the Purgatorio. Um, the figures are constantly saying, as Dante is walking through the Purgatorio, the figures uh, are constantly sub- subjecting themselves or or putting themselves um, under submission to the community there. But they're constantly saying, "Pray for me. Like, make me an object of your prayer. Make me an object." This is the constant question as a constant desire in the souls and purgatory is make me an object make me an object here and so there's in a way this sort of the simple grammatical structure of subject object what connects the subject and the object for dante it's a it's a clear that's the clear question and and the biggest concern is desire so we see that throughout the inferno no one wants to be an object in the inferno, everyone's a subject, and so um, so that's something to consider. Now, what that would suggest is that is that at the center of everything is pride, and yet within the inferno, none of the realms are called pride. So there's no specific realm called the realm of pride. You have lust, gluttony, uh, wrath, envy, uh, the violent, uh, fraudulent. You have all these. You have all these other realms. But you don't have one specifically titled Pride. But the first realm in Purgatorio, of actual Mount Purgatorio, is Pride. And so, so there's something about that, that problem between the subject and the object and making one, allowing oneself to become an object to the right subject. So uh, imagine if that order of... of you are an object to some other subject. Um, if that's a reality, but you refuse that reality, how much torment you're in for eternity to come to the realization that you're an object to some other subject. And it's a complete torment. Unless at some point in life you've, you've come to accept that. So, so anyway, what you'll see with, with the first few uh, figures in the Inferno, you have... Um, the characters in Limbo, you have the characters in the sort of neutral souls. Then you get into uh, Francesca di Ramini in the Lost Bowl, Chiaco in the Gluttonous, and then um, the, the ones in the Avaricious and the Prodigal, unnamed. And a lot of this is very fitting. But, but pay attention to Francesca di, di Ramini, who's, who shows up with Paolo. So we're, she's almost always referred to as Paolo and Francesca as the two. And so there's this sort of subversive uh, image of the hypostatic union. They're, they're in derision of the hypostatic union, the two natures in one. But you see Francesca does not in any way see herself as an object to Paolo, but the opposite. And Paolo is an object to her. And she doesn't, she, she never even refers to his name. She never says his name. She says, Questy, this one, this man, this, this thing, right? And so there's, so you can see it even in the beginning. There's, there's a, there's a, a problem just in that simple 
relationship to the world, the subject object relationship. All right, there's more to more to talk about, and I'll get back to you about things. Hopefully, this isn't this isn't too much, um, but maybe I'll make it a little more uh, about the plot next time. I just wanted you to get a sense of the overarching contemplation. All right, talk to you again soon. Bye bye.